Sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry. I was just going yeah. to say if we were uh, recording yes. or not. No, no, that's 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 okay. You can just. Do you mind uh, mentioning this, or you can you can mention it uh, during the break, right? Okay. Uh, so let's just start with. Um, So maybe with just some general remarks on NTSC gear index theorem. Um, so the, the problem is, uh, I mean, you can approach the subject uh, from many different angles. Uh, so the way I like to present it is, uh, imagine you have a linear operator. Uh, so this is a linear map. Uh, I, I like to call it an operator. So for, for me, linear maps and linear operators or operators are the same thing. Um, so imagine you have a linear map like that between two vector spaces. And imagine you are interested in uh, solving the following equation, df equal to g. Um, so when you have an inhomogeneous equation like that, df equal to g, uh, you might be interested in knowing, for example, dimension of kernel of B. Um, but uh, I can tell you that, um, except when these guys are finite dimensional, computing dimension of kernel is a very hard problem. Uh, and the reason, I mean, at least one reason for this being a hard problem is that uh, this is uh, not a continuous function in, in D. So, so, so let me just say not a continuous function. Um, now, of course, I have to tell you um, what I mean by continuous function in D, because D, after all, is just an operator. But imagine there is a space that you can choose your Ds uh, from. And if you change D slowly uh, from one point to another point, uh, it could happen that this dimension is not, uh, there's no jumps in the dimension. You can easily construct examples of this. So that's, that's one reason why this quantity is kind of hard to compute. Um, and in a similar way, I mean, the things that's related to G is about what conditions G has to satisfy. Uh, so if you think about the number of conditions that G has to satisfy, this is related to co-kernel of this map. Um, so dimension of co-kernel of B is also not continuous um, in D. I mean, I can give a very simple example. Uh, let's look at this example. Uh, for example, just even finite dimensional case, this, 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 story, this story can happen. Imagine you have a kind of family of operators like this. There's epsilon, zero, zero, one. So epsilon is between one and, for example, zero. You see, a dimension of kernel of epsilon I mean, d epsilon, d, that's equal to, well, I mean, if epsilon is not zero, this, uh, this operator is injective, this is zero. So if epsilon is positive, but all of a sudden at zero, this, this is zero, it's dimension, it's peaks of a kernel and this kernel is one dimension, so it's epsilon. You see this function, as a function of epsilon, which is kind of a space of parameters for this problem for you, it's not continuous, right? You, you can easily construct an example for the second one. 
So these uh, things uh, individually, they are not topological invariant, we say. This kernel and co-kernel are not topological invariant. Okay. But what was discovered a uh, long time ago is that uh, uh, the difference for some classes of operators, the difference changes continuously. So let me put it here, but for some operators at least, um, the difference kernel of the minus dimension of co-kernel of the, which is it denoted by index of the Amazingly, and this is not an obvious fact at all, amazingly, this number in many situations, in some good situations, I should say, uh, is continuous. Is continuous. I mean, when I say it's continuous, I mean it's continuous for a a large or for a known at least class of operators that we have to specify later on. We have to say what D is, what W is, and what kind of good Ds uh, are so that this makes it uh, continuous. So this is by itself is an amazing fact. And this number is called Fredholm index. So if you look at it like this, it's, it's a very general uh, problem, general phenomenon. Uh, you can even study it as part of kind of infinite dimensional Lie algebra, and uh, you can prove some fun theorems with that. Or in, in functional analysis, for example, you can study these things in the context of Hilbert spaces. Um, but that's not what uh, a T.S. Singer index theorem is about. Uh, the uh, discovery of Atiyah Singer is that there are uh, some situations where this kind of uh, index can be related to geometry and topology of uh, manifolds. So um, let me then write it like this. So, so by the way, before I go on, so this is a an integer value, not a quantity, right? I mean, it just uh, takes integer values. So it means that on kind of open subsets of a space of these, uh, this is actually constant. That's one reason they call this a topological invariant. It's uh, it's. It's, it's, it's an integer value invariant that is not changing under uh, at least a small perturbations or variations. Of, so it's a top, topological invariant. Okay. So now what this uh, Atiyah Singer discovered, uh, this was around 1961, was that uh, there are uh, many examples of such Ds in geometry. Um, some topological invariants, at least. Um, they can be expressed as index. Expressed. As index of an operator. And uh, not only that, but in those situations that they, they were, they could find a, an alternative formula for computing the index. 
because computing the index, it means you're computing an invariant, a topological invariant for a space. But in many cases, it's kind of hopeless to go through this uh, uh, original definition because uh, it's hard to compute uh, the difference. Uh, it's hard to compute them individually. Uh, but there's an alternative formula because it's a topological invariant that kind of lends itself to uh, being computable in, in closed forms. So uh, let me give you an example as a result, uh, as, uh, so that uh, you see what I'm talking about. So here's example one. That's Euler characteristic, for example. Okay, so um, all the characteristic, uh, well, I mean, okay, so I mean, imagine you have a smooth, uh, closed, or manifold, and you, you know the Euler characteristic. There are many definitions for Euler characteristic, like I of M. So one definition uh, could be something like alternating sums of beta numbers, right? So this is B0 minus B1 plus B2 plus minus N B N. Okay, so what B I is the I petty number. And uh, as you know, this is a dimension of, we, we can define it in many ways. But this is dimension of, for example, some cohomology group HI of N and uh, with coefficients, for example, over R. You can take many different types of cohomology groups, but take your favorite, they're all the same for manifolds. And this is, a, this is an integer that basically counts the number of I dimensional holes in your space. And this uh, alternating sum is is a um, is the um, Betty number. Of, I mean, sorry, is 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 the Euler characteristic of the manifold. So um, now uh, this chi m is actually is 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 an index. Index of an operator. Um, so, so what operator is it? Uh, so in my general uh, definition, I had operator D and then I had this vector spaces V and W's. And so the question is, what are uh, these operators in this case, right? Well, in this case, um, the operator D um, is something that we can write as D plus D star. And this goes from um, direct sum of, say, even uh, forms on a space M, I from zero or whatever. Again, zero. So this is a space of even forms, uh, there are differential forms, to um, odd forms, but here's some of all of them. Okay. So this, uh, there is this D is the wrong differential. So this is a generalization of the gradient uh, or, 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 or um, divergence, or actually gradient operator, for example. We can think of it. takes a P form, sends it to P plus one form. And this D star is the accurate, uh, which is the um, Um, 
you can define this D star if uh, M is a Riemannian manifold. But if, if M is not Riemannian, uh, you cannot define. So, uh, so let's uh, assume that yeah. So the, 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 these are some there are some details here that I will cover later on. But let me just uh, briefly mention a uh, fixed Riemannian metric. Then uh, we'll see actually there, there is a rather deep result of uh, geometry and topology of manifolds that uh, implies that. Uh, so this is basically uh, Hodge theorem. I will, I will mention this and recall this result later on, as I said. So this Hodge theorem basically implies that index of this D. Index of D is equal to um, indeed um, Euler characteristic of M. So this is very good because uh, we are saying uh, that, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, so this index uh, that we had some. Great Kind of abstract definition at first now becomes something very very concrete it measures Euler characteristic of the manifold if you apply this to this operator but that's not index theorem right uh, this is just an observation this is easy to see that the uh, the observation uh, of uh, T.S. Singer for example uh, at first uh, they had other observations but this is one of the things that they notice they can they can observe but that's not index theorem so what is index theorem um, uh, there was another result that calculated order characteristic in terms of Riemannian metric so this was an old result uh, essentially due to Gauss Bonnet and uh, another guy so we call it goes for me um, for services. So imagine you have a closed oriented Riemannian surface. So we take a closed oriented surface plus a Riemannian metric on the surface. So imagine you have this sort of shape um, with several holes and you uh, kind of put it in a space and then it absorbs, it, it, it gets a metric from the ambient space. Uh, there is a way of measuring distances on, on this M uh, by uh, finding uh, like uh, shortest path from that, uh, that lies on this space and you measure the length of this path as a pass in a space, but it has to be always on the surface. So that gives you a Riemannian metric, and this is the Riemannian metric that comes here. And the goes for a theorem says that chi of m, in this case, is one over two pi integral k dA over m. Now let me tell you what this k is. This K is the Gauss curvature of M. So this is the Gauss curvature. M. And this DA is area element. So it just basically uh, gives you a way of measuring areas. If you integrate, for example, if K was one, if you integrate dA over M, you get the whole area of the surface. But in general, we have the integrate K against this area element. So this is, if you want, this is some sort of average uh, curvature of uh, your space, of your uh, surface. Uh, divide by 2 pi, you get uh, Euler characteristic. 
So this is the classic two-dimensional Gauss Monet theorem. And um, so now by this observation, this is actually equal to index of D. So now this is uh, the side, uh, this result is a kind of prototype at your single index theorem now, because we have an operator, its index is this topological invariant, that's fine, but it's given by this explicit uh, differential form, which is KDA. And uh, this is what a Tessinger uh, index theorem tries to achieve in general for uh, general manifolds and for general, uh, say, elliptic operators on manifolds and vector bundles and all these things. Okay, but this is a prototype uh, index theorem. So, in general, This uh, goes for a theorem. So if you have mg, which is a um, say closed Riemannian manifolds, dimension two m. The dimension is even. Okay, so this is. Um, then uh, this general gauss monet theorem says that in this generality also, I am, there is some constant, which I don't know right now, I don't remember. So let's call it some constant, say C to N. Then there is integral of some uh, differential form, which I write it by this, I, I call it. This is called Fafian, and there's a way of constructing a 2n form. Uh, and then, if you integrate this 2n form on the manifold, you get Euler patches. And this is also an example of a Tiersinger index. Uh, what uh, Tiersinger proof uh, covers this as a very, very special case. But this theorem was a very hard theorem. Uh, it took, uh, so this was around, this result was around. 1870s. Remember, it was after Gauss even uh, when this was eventually proved in this form. But this result uh, was around the 1930s, and then there was a there was a, a very uh, kind of uh, nice proof after 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 it was discovered and proved by other people. There was a nice proof by Chern around 1940. 43 maybe or something. Okay. So it took quite some time to first of all guess what the form of this differential form should be and how to generalize this. Now it is a remarkable theorem, right? Because your metric could change. You can you can you can have you can bend the surface in any special way around here or there. And then uh, what, what happens is that some places gets bigger curvature. If you bend it sharp, you have a faster way. And then if you flat the surface in some areas in a smooth way, flatten it, it doesn't change this topological environment, which is Euler characteristic. Always uh, you can integrate curvature and you always get the same. So here also, this differential form very much depends on the metric. It will change uh, from metric uh, to metric, but its integral does it and gives you some. So this was a, a kind of another clue for a tier seeker that uh, there should be a formula. I mean, they really had uh, other clues, uh, I should say, but this is in hindsight, and they eventually, I uh, mean, they, they more or less immediately understood that this also is covered by the general theorem. But now there is another example, which we also cover later in the course. This is, um, there's a very famous theorem in uh, Riemann surface theory, it's called uh, uh, Riemann Rock theorem.
Um, the situation is a bit like here, except that uh, now you start not just with the surface uh, um, and the Riemannian metric, actually you start with the surface um, and the complex structure, and you pick some points on the surface with some weights. Um, so this is, uh, say, sigma now, maybe M. So pick a divisor. I mean, the terminology, the classic terminology is called divisor. And M. So what is divisor? Divisor is just uh, a choice of finite number of points and uh, some uh, labels, integers uh, attached to this. So D is equal to sum np and then p. So it's, it's a formal sum, which is uh, np's are zero except uh, for a finite number of uh, these things, places. This is called the divisor. The Riemann rock term uh, in, for, for, for Riemann surfaces, it, it says uh, L of D minus L of K minus D is equal to degree of D minus uh, uh, genus G plus one. Okay, so let me um, explain a little bit of this. You see, uh, what is nice about Riemann rock theorem is that in this case, actually, the left hand side, you see there's a difference of two numbers. So, if uh, a Tian Singer understood that, this can also be, uh, be interpreted as index of an operator. Okay, so this is actually equal to index of some operator D for some D. Uh, that uh, depends on the Riemann surface, that D depends on the Riemann surface and depends on the divisor. We'll see exactly how. Okay, so now what is L of D? D is dimension of uh, some space of metamorphic. Uh, Functions. You see, this D, you have to think that uh, some points are designated and some integers are attached. So we are looking at metamorphic functions whose poles are not too bad, whose poles are actually stronger than in P at those points. So they can have poles only at these points, and they don't have poles uh, at other points. And Riemann Rock shows that this number is finite. Now, this L of K minus D, this K is not curvature, by the way. This K is different. So this is called canonical divisor. This is another divisor. It's called canonical divisor. Uh, we will see that uh, later on. It doesn't matter. Uh, but the, again, once you fix that, this is defined another space of um, as a dimension of another space of uh, metamorphic function that has uh, this particular relation to this device. So basically this result tries to count number of um, metamorphic functions of certain type on your Riemann surface. Now look at, let's look at the, the right-hand side. The right-hand side is completely uh, topological. This G is the genus of the surface, and this degree of D is the sum of NP. Again, we will see that this has very nice interpretation in terms of uh, some line bundles on, on, on the space uh, that you can attach to this D. And uh, this becomes an example of uh, a tier single index theorem. Uh, so this is so Riemann rock. Uh, but then, of course, there is a much more general Riemann rock theorem which works for complex manifolds of uh, any dimension, compact complex manifolds on any dimension. 
And instead of these divisors, you have these holomorphic vector bundles on the manifold. And that result also is a special case of uh, a TSA engineering. So this sort of quantity is, is computed by a TSA engineering. In that case, the right hand side is the right hand side of the uh, a TSA engineering. So, so what we are trying to do in this course now is to look at some of the uh, necessary background for this. Now, one of the backgrounds that we're going to start uh, immediately is the way to construct these operators D, right? Are there any questions? Okay, so, uh, so before I uh, stop, uh, just uh, advertising, uh, What's our first goal? Um, um, so we want to create a large supply of these uh, good operators D. These are uh, called the Dirac operators. Operators. So they provide a large sub supply of such Ds, which are good, and a single index theorem applies to those operators. So this gives us Ds, good Ds. So we want to understand uh, how to construct these Dirac operators and uh, what we can do with them. Um, so just uh, uh, very quickly, the, one of the ideas of Dirac operators is this. On a flat space, a Dirac operator is the square root of the Laplacian. Okay. So on flat space. D uh, squared. It's, it, it is an operator that satisfies this equation. Remember this equation as a kind of uh, kind of symbol um, or uh, mean. If you d squared is equal to delta. Well, what is delta? Delta is Laplacian. So this is equal to minus. Now remember, we are on flat space. So Laplacian is very easy here. So this is uh, d to d x1 squared uh, plus d to d x2 squared plus d n d x n squared. It's uh, just uh, the standard Laplacian. And I put minus sign here. Uh, so D tries uh, to write down the first order differential operator that satisfies this. So D, if you want, you can try something like this, sigma gamma mu, um, D dx mu, mu from one to n. You can try your hand with uh, such operators. And then uh, if you square this, uh, well, I mean, well, what's the square of this guy? The square of this guy is going to be equal to some uh, mu nu. I mean, gamma mu, gamma nu plus gamma nu, gamma mu. Um, d dx mu d2 dx mu dx mu right and this you want to be equal to equal to that and then uh, you get the relations that you get these relations which are called Clifford relations which is gamma mu 
chiamonium plus chiamonium chiamonium is equal to minus two delta mu nu, right? Because these guys are zero, and there are no mixed uh, operations here. I mean, partial derivatives, just uh, pure square partial derivatives, and this imposes this relation. Okay. Now, what does these relations tell you? It just tells you that if you want to solve uh, this uh, equation for some first order partial differential operators, you cannot find your operator within the world of uh, operators with coefficients uh, as real numbers or complex numbers. There are no sets of complex numbers that satisfy this equation except when n is equal to one. So n equal to one is totally trivial. Of course, it's already a square of ddx1, or is i ddx1 square, right? So we are not interested in that. We want to go dimension two and above that. Right? You want to go dimension two and above that, you cannot have uh, this equation satisfied by any set of complex numbers. So this was uh, one of the big obstacles. Uh, Dirac knew that he had to find this kind of operators D, but um, there was an obstacle. But then he noticed he had some amazing insight uh, after thinking about the problem for a long time. The insight was that these equations can be solved within the world of matrices. This was a this was a big big discovery. Um, so um, let me write it here. So as I said, they, they are called. Of course, I mean maybe I shouldn't say of course, but mathematicians were here before physicists. So Clifford and Hamilton and uh, Cayley and some other guys have already taught big and long about these issues. And in particular, they have considered such relations, especially Clifford, and that's why they're called Clifford algebra relations. So our first goal is to analyze these relations um, and find all possible solutions to such, uh, such equations. So goal one is what are Solutions of uh, star. So in other words, we want to find all possible incarnations of Clifford algebra relations, all possible matrices that satisfy these equations for all possible values of n. So this is a purely algebraic problem, purely algebra problem, right? So that's one, one thing. And second problem is that this uh, I mean, this equation is good only on flat space. If your space is curved, as we are interested in, as you saw, and if it has curvature, then this relation is not good. Still, we are interested in something similar to this. So we want to define Dirac operators in general on curved spaces. So our goal is um, modify to define uh, drug operators on curve spaces. And for this, we will see that um, we have to introduce some uh, gadgets uh, that called spinners. So we need spinners, spin groups, and they give rise to the lock operators in general. So that's, that's, that's our first goal. Um, 
uh, we have to solve both problems. There's a purely algebraic problem, and there's a second problem, which is a bit um, topological and uh, manifold deep. So we'll solve this um, as our first goal. As I said, the key, the clue, main thing in all of this, uh, luckily, one and two are actually related problems. Uh, we can solve both problems within one context. That's the context of Clifford algebra. So uh, that's where uh, we start uh, everything uh, to to sort of gradually unravel this uh, uh, Singer index theorem. We start from Clifford algebra. As I said. There are different openings to the subject. You can reach it from different angles, uh, but this is uh, the one that uh, right now seems to be quite reasonable. So I will stop uh, the um, um, video now. I'll pause.